So when it aired for the last time, over 100 million people watched that final episode that evening. Now, contrast that with The Office. When the final episode of The Office aired, six million people watched it. Only six million. However, once it moved to Netflix, it became the most streamed series. So what I want to highlight here is that when you change the, the way that people can watch, what they want to watch, how they want to watch it, where they want to watch it, the consumption of content changes. So for, in terms of social media usage and time spent, you're looking at Facebook and YouTube in terms of uh, overall uh, being the top two for time spent. But no matter the platform, we're looking at lots of uh, types of content in many forms. Some of you will probably have your favorite list of podcasts, myself included. The rise of podcasts, it's portability. You can listen to a podcast in the car. You can listen to it while you're working out. Uh, the portability and the flexibility of listening um, is part of, the, or part of the, the factors that are influencing its rise. Here's an example of a popular podcast stuff you should know. Now, the reason I bring this particular podcast up is because if your organization is struggling to figure out what should we say, what kind of content should we produce, I don't want you to worry or get hung up on the fact of we don't have anything to say because they talk for 41 minutes about an Etch-a-Sketch. So the bar is very, very low to entertain, to engage, uh, and to provide viable content. Other topics from them have included what makes us yawn, how barcodes work, how yo-yos work, how igloos work, when you are pressed for time, safety pins, turbulence, does the five second rule really work? And my favorite, they talk for an hour about the ballpoint pen and the rivalry between two inventors, one of them, Mr. Parker. As they had patents, they were warring for the emergence of the ballpoint pen. And if they can make an entertaining hour about the ballpoint pen, surely you have a story that you can share that would engage your listeners and your audience. The top 10 most listened to podcasts, Joe Rogan, The Daily, Crime Junkie, This American Life, Stuff You Should Know, which I just talked about, My Favorite Murder, Pod Save America, Office Ladies, another office reference, Serial, Call Her Daddy. There's a lot of true crime in there. But there's also some politics. There's also some entertainment. You can see the diversity. The genres that are popular, comedy being number one, news, and we just talked about true crime, sports, and so on. So there's different niches that you can consider for your content. There's often a debate about how, how long a podcast should be. Joe Rogan's episodes are two to three hours long. Neil Patel and Eric Sue, they do a podcast every day that's six to eight minutes long, and that's it. But they produce them in a batch every two weeks. So you can decide what uh, fits best for you. In the U.S., 62% of users access YouTube daily. YouTube is the world's second most visited website. 694,000 hours of video are streamed each minute. And 81% of internet users have used YouTube, just to name a few. And there's 1,200% more shares are generated by social videos than text or images combined. Think about YouTube more as a place to put your uh, video files when you have them. Don't put yourself into an arbitrary burden of creating video too frequently if you can't uh, maintain that commitment consistently. According to Cisco, by the end of this year, 82% of social content will be video. Think about the last thing you shared, the last thing that provoked you from an, uh, from an emotional perspective. It was likely video. As we move left to right, videos dominate for, for content consumption, and way over on the right are blogs and PDFs. So for those of you that are still producing blogs and PDF articles, there's nothing wrong with that, but we're gonna get into how to work smarter and, and um, uh, rather than harder with that kind of content. So you wanna lead with content that educates, that provides value, and that's helpful to your con uh, content consumer. We're gonna make a switch.
and I'm, hello, looks like I'm back. Jay Bear talks about making sure that your content provides the best answer. So many of you will not know this co company, it's called Indium Corporation, they make solder paste. That is the element used to connect um, electronic components to assembly boards. When I interviewed their director of marketing, their motto is content to contact to cash. Their head of sales said that the social media generated leads were the most qualified. Now, if they can write about solder paste and related materials and make it viable and profitable for them to do so, such that their head of sales says the, the, they generate the most qualified leads, then surely you've got an idea that will turn into to, um, high performing content. A lot of you have probably already seen this or experienced this um, yourselves. Organic reach on Facebook is, uh, is moving towards near zero. It's getting more and more challenging for your content to be seen on Facebook. If you're starting a Facebook page today and you don't have a paid budget to boost the page and its content, you're going to be really, really challenged to get it off the ground. BuzzSumo did a study examining over um, several hundred million posts to the tune of like 700 million plus. Top performing content was video. Posts with a link, posts with an image were the, some of the least performing pieces of content. Again, the challenge and the, the, um, the signs are already there. Richer media content is where you need to be heading and where, what you need to be considering in your overall content planning. In terms of genres or content types to guide you, um, something inspirational, funny, practical. People will forgive production value for immediacy, transparency, and, and being more human. User-generated content on the rise. This is why you're seeing TikTok um, come, in, in, come into play, but Facebook still beats out TikTok for short-form videos. These are the most popular uh, Facebook fan uh, pages globally. Facebook's own page, Samsung, Christian Ronaldo, uh, and so on. You can see they're rather diverse from sports to brands to music artists and comedy. We cannot ignore TikTok and its rise. Number uh, one most downloaded app in 2021. It's the sixth most used social platform in the world and rising and over 1 billion uh, monthly active users. And it is now the more popular than Instagram among Gen Z. At a minimum, if your organization doesn't have a presence there, set up a TikTok account just to squat on the name. Recently, someone went onto True Social and they weren't the corporation, but it was just an individual person and they set up Walmart's account on True Social. Now, Walmart will have to pay them to get it back. So your, your brand may not be as big as Walmart, but this, uh, I'm just saying from a governance, you want to make sure that your brand is protected. Go on TikTok and set up the account and just leave it dormant until when and if you're ready to use it. But you know, Facebook, um, recently there was talk about Facebook hired an uh, agency to disseminate misinformation about memes like attacking uh, teachers. These were planted stories to uh, attack the reputation of TikTok. They're that much of a competitive threat to Facebook that Facebook was doing its own misinformation campaign to attack it. While TikTok is on the rise, do not, do not ignore Instagram. It still garners more engagement than Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn combined. But it requires rich media. It's high engagement, not a great refer of traffic to your website. So it has its value, it's, it has its place, but you need to understand what it can and cannot do for you. We are competing for people's attention. We want to stop the scroll. We're engaging people from a two to three inch, a two by three inch screen from their phones. So what is it you can offer them in terms of content that's going to stop them scrolling, stop them flicking their thumb? This is just a screenshot, but this is a video where someone took a knife and a piece of wire and they created a DIY peeler. You know, it may be hard to see, 
This YouTube video about a makeshift peeler has 98 million views. I wish I could get 98 million views on some of my content. I'm not going to go into the business of making peelers at home, but they did and it worked for them. With the rise of the uh, Ice Bucket Challenge on Facebook, Facebook realized how important user-generated content was, as well as natively uploaded video, rather than video shared from a, a site like YouTube. All of the platforms give preferential treatment to video natively uploaded to their platforms, as opposed to you redirecting to YouTube. This is so good. Also, what you have the bottom is if you So there's a software company taking the definition of a sandwich and turning it into content, using their own software to take you through what is and isn't a sandwich. So can, can you think about what your organization specializes in and what that might inspire in terms of the type of content you might want to produce? Okay, so you want this? Yeah. But you want this? Yeah. Okay, so in order to get that, you have to do this. Yeah. Now, it may not be, it won't tell you there, but that's LinkedIn's corporate account on TikTok. 20-something producing a video from her living room of her condo or her apartment. That's going out on a corporate account. The bar is lower on TikTok, and that's not a criticism. It's this kind of user-generated content, low production value, immediacy that people are looking for. And if LinkedIn can go this direction with their content, so can you. I can see exactly where it is. Wow! Good. Feel free to shout out your guesses. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sorry I don't have a t-shirt for you. <laughs> the reason I want to show you that is often in this day and age now we are in a war for talent. That company is called Lumberland. You can see the different videos, but they do these trivia uh, types of content. They have fun at work and they put it online. They have over a million and a half views, uh, follow, sorry, a million and a half followers. And depending on the video, some of them are getting the millions of views, hundreds of thousands, just showing how fun it is to work there. 
and just engage their employees and asking simple questions. They'll put up a picture of a country, like the like you know a geographic map, and say, "Guess this country." You can go onto their channel and look at all the different categories of content that they've created that are just you know 30 seconds, a minute, a minute and a half, whatever. And this is how they've garnered an audience. And indirectly, they are marketing who they are, which is Lumberland, and they make a beer uh, glass shaped like a baseball bat. That's it. Something simple. But this is how they're getting garnering an audience. And so if you're looking to use video and just content overall for employer branding to convey transparency about your culture and so on, maybe they'll inspire you. Short piece of content, no audio other than some music, telling the story, at least I think five and if not a half a dozen different stories, someone retiring, uh, someone, uh, you know, a couple with a, a, the birth of a child on, on the horizon, all these stories being shared in a very short period of time without saying a word. Over 80% of the video watched on Facebook is watched without audio. So think about how many, uh, how much content you have to share with out the audio. Yes, you can do captions and so on and to, to bridge that gap, but you have to bear in mind from an accessibility point of view, can I tell the story without sound? Another well simple example that I really like, I don't know how many of you in the room produce press releases for your organization or you know, announcements of some kind, and, they, and for what it, I do a lot of work in financial services, and certain press releases have to adhere to a certain format and so on, so it's very, very constrained. Also, some of the driest content you can dream of producing. But when Wealthsimple re uh, reached $4 billion of assets under management, they used this to complement their uh, press release, and this went out on some of their social channels, including Instagram. Just an animated GIF of a stairwell going up made out of zeros and the number four for $4 billion under management. Think of the CEO of your organization um, doing a little video, why is the press release uh, noteworthy? Uh, an animated GIF, if there's a provocative number from your press release, so some milestone achievement, turn it into an animated GIF, turn it into a visual graphic of some kind. Do something as a jumping off point from the press release to give it more power, because we all know press releases aren't that exciting. So why, like, why should I pause and take notice of your announcement? We're doing work on a web series called Hello Again. Uh, it's available on CBC Gem, which is, I'm from I'm Toronto. So the UK has BBC, we have the Canadian Broadcast Corporation, CBC, and they have a web uh, platform. You've got Paramount Plus, et cetera, here, uh, and we have CBC Gem. And this series called Hello Again was created by Simu Liu of Shang-Chi fame. He was originally supposed to star in it, but he got busy with Marvel. So um, when the series had an early review after its launch, we took a quote from the review and made a visual graphic for it. Again, it doesn't have to be an announcement from, from the organization. Instead of just sharing a link and something that was said about the show, we created a graphic and threw a provocative quote from the reviewer uh, on that backdrop and shared it through social. When it was International Women's Day, the production, um, there's a number of the producers that are women and then the director is uh, a woman and many of the crew are women as well. So on International Women's Day, we wanted to celebrate all the women involved in the production. <laughs> Thank you. 
So we had this you know, folder filled with images from behind the scenes. And so instead of just sharing them one at a time, or even as a carousel on Instagram, we brought them to life in an animation. And you know, we used them, as on, you know, especially on a milestone day like International Women's Day. So bringing images to life, again, not that hard to do. And it made for a much better piece of content than just sharing a, a series of static images. We have to get away from this. I wrote this blog, we put it on our website, we shared it on Twitter once uh, or on LinkedIn or both, and then check, one and done. And we move on to the next piece of content. Because if we start looking at our Google Analytics and we realize, oh, that blog that we shared on Twitter or LinkedIn or both, hmm, three people visited it, three people clicked the link, or they, 10 people clicked the link and only two stuck when they went to the, to the link because it wasn't particularly engaging content, and we only shared it once. Start thinking about, there's nothing wrong with writing a blog, but use it as a foundational piece of content. Leverage the existing content you already have. Past blogs, can they be revisited, refreshed, add new data to them? Can you take, extract some data from it uh, and turn them into some visual graphics to you know, make them pop in social feeds and still drive traffic back to that post? User-generated content, think about your content from evergreen versus time-bound. How much evergreen content do you have that you can keep in rotation? Time-bound stuff that has an expiry date or speaks to too, uh, too narrow a, uh, a time period, you won't have that same flexibility. Put the emphasis on rich media, animated GIFs, provocative graphics, etc., because that will garner more engagement. Using the blog example I just gave you, so can you collate a series of your blogs and turn it into an ebook, make it a downloadable PDF? Can you, there are tools out there like Lumen5 and a bunch of others that will take text and turn it into an animated video. There are um, tools out there that will read your blog and turn it into an audio file to make it more accessible. And suddenly, okay, my foundational piece of content, this blog post is now a video, is now an audio file, and suddenly I've got three assets uh, from the same source. That audio file could become a short podcast. If there's you know, interesting, noteworthy facts from your blog, turn them into slides, share it as a Google Doc, or put it on SlideShare. If it's a blog that's about 10 things you need to know about X, or five things you need to know about Y, make that listicle into a infographic to complement the blog. If you have an email newsletter, put in some industry content into the newsletter to accompany your one or more of your own blogs. Keep those blogs in rotation through your newsletter, but don't rely solely on your own content. Find some interesting uh, industry content to complement your own and as, as well to help you move away from only being promotional. And no disrespect to any of your organizations, so um, one of the financial services clients that we work with in, in Canada, we got a piece of content from the BBC that talked about uh, President Biden's um, putting the US back into the Paris Accord. No disrespect to our client, but the BBC is a global brand, 100 plus years old, and it was talking about a very, very um, uh, popular topic about the Paris Accord and climate and so on, it was relevant to their space. They don't have the reach or the brand recognition that the BBC does. So we suggested that they share that piece of content and sure enough, it was one of the best performing pieces of content that they ever put on any of their social channels. So reduce the burden on yourselves for producing content and find industry relevant content that's brand aligned uh, that can you know, lessen the burden on yourselves. I have a podcast called, in, in spirit of low production, called the Low Production High Value Show. It goes out through podcast.co. That gets pushed to uh, Apple iTunes. It gets pushed to Spotify and a few others. But then we also put it on, we have a podcast page on the website with all the different episodes as they go live placed there. And there's video versions of it that go up on YouTube as well. 
So the, the goal is that instead of sending them to a Spotify link, I send them to the landing page on my website. So my website gets the traffic. If after they listen to the episode or while they're listening, they want to venture around and take a look at the website, learn more about what we do. I'm looking at maximizing the channels of distribution for my podcast content, but I also want to control where they spend their time. I don't know how many of you are also looking, when you're creating a podcast, work smarter rather than harder. Create the podcast, you've got the master file. If you can record it on video too, great. That means you've got another uh, format of the content. You'll have your master or full length episode, but then parse it into small provocative clips. So these, these iterations of the business are uh, essential to survival. You know, we, it's not only a business will pivot, and it's only by surviving from one pivot to the next that we've been successful. But I get to say, you know, my business is 15 years old. Um, if I had been married to what we did, you know, oh, we are this kind of business, this is what we do because this is what I want to do. Uh, there's no way we would survive more than two or three years. And I see that with other entrepreneurs too, that they'll come in and express an idea of, oh, I want to start this, and I think this is really needed out there. You know what, if that people buy it, it's not a business. Uh, you can't sell what you think you want to offer. You don't have anything. So that's taking an audio clip in a nice snackable piece of content. If I want to create a graphic and put her one quote that says, if nobody wants to buy it, you don't have a business. That's a very provocative quote and I could put that on a graphic. And again, suddenly I'm, let, I'm just pulling interesting pieces out of the master episode. I'm not having to create something from scratch. I'm, making, I'm squeezing as much juice out of the lemon as I can. And here's, you know, um, Here's the video version. But the reason I bring that up is just, to, again, squeezing as much juice out of the lemon. But let me, I don't want to play it. But So there's a company called Lately that has an artificial intelligence-based tool that will take a blog and uh, scan it and then give you recommended pieces of uh, content as excerpts from the blog. It'll take a video file and parse it into clips like this. They stopped putting their emphasis on who attended their webinars, and they do one every Tuesday called Office Hours. They, didn't, they stopped paying attention to, oh, I hope 100 people show up, or 300, or whatever. They stopped worrying about that, because they learned by taking this approach to parsing their content, putting out provocative clips in the days that followed. They got more cumulative engagement through the content that followed the day of the webinar than from the webinar itself. They refer to it as after-the-fact marketing. So don't get hung up on a particular day and time for your content. Give your content more opportunity to be seen and consumed. This is a company called Wealthy Works, uh, founded by a friend of mine. They've got their blog on their website. It may be hard to see from the back. But there's also a play button above the text and below the image. Again, from an accessibility, you can have the article read to you. So give people the option. If you're putting together some written material, if they want to um, uh, listen to it instead. Some of you may have heard of the platform called Descript. They now, um, they acquired a company out of Montreal. I can record my voice reading a, a, a portion of text. Then using artificial intelligence, I can give the platform another selection of text and it will be read back to me in my voice takes my recording, uses AI, and gives me new content using my voice. Scary, interesting, as long as it's not making claims using my voice, I'm, I'm not so worried. But if you have written content, again, just it lessens the burden, working smarter rather than harder. Oh, I've got 10 blogs, it'll read it for me in my voice. Job done. So some closing thoughts. I want you to think, and we'll have uh, lots of time for, for Q&A. Are your content efforts consistent? And what kind of analytics are you seeing based on your consistency? If you had to survey the people that are consuming your content, do they see it as valuable and how would you know? 
Are you providing the best answer with your content? Your audience is hungry for content, but are you giving them the right kind of content? Are you, you know, satisfying their hunger? As I hope I've highlighted with some of the examples I've shared, the bar for good content isn't particularly high. Simple over complex is preferred. People, your audience will forgive production value for access and immediacy. Look no further than TikTok. People are shooting from their phone. I have a degree in film production. And there, I can do better, a better job on my phone than all of the equipment that was made available to me during film school. Higher quality imagery, I can edit on my phone. It's, it's you know, I, I'm never cease uh, to be um, amazed by all that. Don't put the burden of content creation and content, the content ideation solely on your shoulders. Talk to your colleagues, talk to your clients, talk to other stakeholders. I call it wearing your content hat. If you look at the example I gave you from Lumberland, that's content on all they did was uh, had a trivia contest. They asked people, you know, celebrity um, uh, high school yearbook pictures, but they've done all sorts of things. They have puzzles and you name it. But again, they, the burden on anyone to produce content there was very, very low and very simple. And always be on the lookout for content opportunities. So if you or someone in your organization is gonna be interviewed on a virtual webinar, have them set up their phone beside them and record themselves. They may or may not end up having the, uh, access to the resulting webinar content, but the video of them responding to the questions, participating in the panel and so on is captured by their phone. And they can turn that into short video clips Audio files of them, you know, answering a question with a very you know, provocative or, or well thought out response. And so they're making the most of their time when they're participating in a webinar or giving a presentation. Work smarter rather than harder. Now, while I didn't mention much in the case of Twitter or LinkedIn, um, the, all the principles that I've just shared with you apply there as well. Something to be mindful of, it started the talk about it started last week. Polls on LinkedIn are being discussed as being downgraded. They are being overused as clickbait. So LinkedIn is looking at downgrading them. So if you were relying heavily on those as provocative content, nothing wrong with that. We did the same with some of our clients, but there's a risk that we'll be penalized if we overuse them. So again, Platforms continue to evolve. What worked a month ago may not work uh, next week. So we have to keep uh, morphing our game. I've written a book that came out on Amazon in March. Um, it has um, elements in it about social media marketing, but it also talks where a lot of um, books on social media marketing don't. It talks about social media operations. If you're developing a social media policy, working with legal and HR, et cetera. It's not the sexy part of, of social media, but it's oftentimes the necessary part of getting your social media agenda through your organization. So anyway, um, I invite you to, to uh, check it out. Um, I am exhibiting outside if you want to come by and have a conversation later. And with that, I'll thank you and we'll open the floor for questions. Question over there. Oh, sorry, did I? There, but if there's someone here first. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I actually have two questions, but they're a bit related. Okay. Um, so on your bar graph, one of the bar graphs that you showed, I think it was video first and then email newsletter was second. Mm -hmm. And then you brought back newsletters later. Um, with newsletters and press releases, my understanding or my hope is that they are starting <laughs> to die down as you know as social media platforms as you know did we increase use on that so if you can speak more to, to the use of news, newsletters especially since they're second to video right well as much as i'm up here talking about social media if i survey the room and say how many of you are on linkedin how many of you are on twitter how many of you are on tiktok etc i'm not going to get 100 percent of the room right and even if maybe maybe linkedin i might be safe you're all on linkedin then i ask how many of you actively use it and then the percentage drops off Every one of you in the room has an email address. 
So this is why I say newsletters shouldn't be ignored. Mm. Now, yes, there's issues around open rate and so on, but email is ubiquitous. And so we use social to garner signups for our newsletter. We use social to, to find performing content that we can include in our newsletter as a value add. So that's why I'm suggesting not to ignore it. And as well, you've seen uh, LinkedIn pushing their newsletter functionality now from company pages because they've been having issues for a long time about the poor performance of company pages. Company pages are free. They're a digital outpost for your organization. Use them. The, you can have up to 10 showcase pages on LinkedIn. You can do product lines, careers, etc. They're free. Make use of them. But now that with this newsletter functionality, that maybe there's more value you can squeeze out of, uh, out of LinkedIn and use the content you're creating for social, but you know, push it into the newsletter on LinkedIn. And was that a more- The other one was press releases. Okay. I mean, there are strategies that still you know, encourage continuous pushing of press releases, whereas others are, you know, just depend on your social because that's where press might be going to right. learn more about your topic. So, so I'm, the, you. I'm the former head of social media strategy for the Royal Bank of Canada. And there was a Twitter account that had 700 followers, and it was all only followed by journalists. There was zero engagement. They, they followed it solely to receive company news. Now, if you have a channel that serves that purpose, fine. And basically, you kind of set, you, you resolve yourself. That channel serves this purpose, and I'm not anticipating engagement. Dell had a, um, a Twitter channel's um, sole purpose was for disseminating information about refurbished equi equipment available for sale. And they said, if you have, this channel is not for support, go to this channel if you have a question. So they, they informed their audience what this channel's purpose was and how, how it would serve them and what it wasn't. And so in the case of is disseminating press releases, it, as long as that press release isn't time bound and you want to keep it in rotation, the shelf life of a tweet is less than 15 minutes. So there's nothing to say you can't share it Monday at 10 a.m. and Thursday at 4, because the likelihood is you're going to reach different people. And again, this, my presentation is about, you know, the, um, we are at war for um, garnering people's interest. So if you want to put it on LinkedIn and pin it to the top, but again, don't just make it a static text headline about, you know, we now announced 20% you know, growth for the quarter. How noteworthy is that 20%? Can you give me an animated gift to make it pop in my feed? Again, I'm this far away from the next piece of content. So what is going to, about your press release or the visualization of it that's gonna make me stop my scroll? Okay, question over there. I'm glad I finally got to catch one. All right, uh, <laughs> my question is, uh, you were talking about TikTok a yes. minute or two ago, and maybe not a minute or two, but at some point you were talking about TikTok, the biggest, most downloaded app in the world, B2B space. You, we saw the one example of like, you know, the, the guest, the yearbook photo from, right. from the business. Uh, didn't really apply to their business, but created content. So like if, how uh, in a general way, do you see B2B type businesses outside of the, here's content that is appealable to the masses representing themselves in this sort of new environment that's mm -hmm. still figuring itself out? So um, you're starting to see the same thing that happened to Instagram for B2B players happen on TikTok now. So a lot of B2B organizations said like Instagram isn't for us, it's millennial, Gen Z, et cetera and it's visual, et cetera. Well, over time, gradually, B2B marketers couldn't ignore it anymore. They had to figure out, what do I use uh, Instagram for? And a lot of it became using it as a portal to convey corporate culture, to celebrate employees and so on. Had nothing to do with marketing the product or service or had less so. Like Lumberland, they're not marketing their product or service. They're marketing themselves or they're just saying, this is a day at work, a typical day at work where we have a trivia contest for three minutes or whatever it is. And it's a halo effect for their brand. So it's in some ways, it, um, especially if you have to make a business case for someone like, okay, you got to trust me on this. I need three months, maybe six months. I'm going to make content that has nothing to do with the product or service. Do I have your permission? I know that's going to be a tough, <laughs> tough case to make in some organizations, but 
you know, I just was listening to a podcast, Joe Polizzi from the Content Marketing Institute talked about the monetization of content taking 12 to 18 months. 12 to 18 months. It's going to be hard to make a case to anyone about content marketing if that's the horizon. But if anyone knows about content marketing, Joe Polizzi and the Content Marketing Institute founder that he is, probably has some, some uh, history there that he can draw upon. So when it comes to TikTok, as with all the other platforms, jump on it, be consistent, one post a day, maybe three a week, whatever you can manage, but just be consistent. And one of the things about TikTok compared to all the others is the, uh, their algorithm right now organically is like no other. Is pushing stuff to your page. It has nothing to do with who you're following. It has to do with the content you're engaging with and consuming. So you can actually get pretty good organic performance from TikTok. Even And I'm seeing, as I've started to engage with B2B providers, my B2B content has just risen. I'm getting an influx of a lot of solopreneurs that are like, I'll help you get bigger on TikTok, and they have 50 followers. And I'm like, okay, I get it. Maybe you're big on Instagram. That's fine. I'm not here to cite them. But you, you, know, you have to figure out what is your angle. And if it's just going to be selling your product or service, I don't think you're going to be that, all that welcome on TikTok. But if you educate, engage, entertain, one of my favorite providers on, or content creators on um, TikTok, her name is Elise Myers. And if you don't know her, she has four and a half million followers and she's just human. That's all, just human. She tells hilarious uh, stories about her life, and it all began with a blind date where she bought 100 tacos. And now she has her own merch. And I'm not saying that you, your goal should be that you become a creator where you're making money and you're selling merch. She's just being herself, she's being human, and she's telling stories. And if you can be human and you can tell stories through your content, then any channel will, I might be viable for you. I know that's a long-winded and I got away from your question, but. B2B, I, I just, TikTok is, is you know, opening up for B2B, but it's figuring out what you're going to be there as a B2B uh, service provider or, um, or a specialist. I mean, if you show up guns a blazing, like look at me, buy my stuff versus showing up and being helpful and you know, engaging with your content, you'll be better served. That's my take anyway. Can I ask a quick follow-up? Can, I, can yep. I ask a quick follow-up? Sure. Is there a point where you make the turn? So let's say you've got, I, I know the taco woman. Uh, I remember that yeah. TikTok series. So now she's got 4 million followers. Let's say she was a B2B account. Mm -hmm. Is there a point where you start to, in, like, is there a point when you know when you start to introduce what you are trying right. to market as a result of that strategy? So some of you may have heard the rule 80-20 or 80-10-10. So where we earn the right, to uh, promote ourselves, even before TikTok. And the example I like to give is, so we did some work for a number of years, we managed the social media for Bladder Cancer Canada. This is, that's, even though it doesn't sound like it's B2B, just bear with me. If I went to the Facebook page of Bladder Cancer Canada on Monday and I was asked to donate and I donated and I came back Tuesday and you asked me to donate and I came back Wednesday and you asked me to donate, I'm not coming back Thursday because I know what you want. I already donated on Monday. Is that all you got? But if I come back Tuesday and you have an article about dietary considerations during chemo and Wednesday, it's how to talk to a um, someone with cancer and, and Thursday, it's responsibilities of a caregiver and Friday, it's an announcement of a new drug trial or a grant being awarded to, for physicians to, for research. I've now created content or I've curated content from other sources for all the stakeholders that surround someone affected by cancer. So when you think about B2B, I can earn the right to promote, but I don't make it my sole purpose. I don't put that as the emphasis first. I get, it goes back to, is my content of value? Is it educating? Is it you know, um, you know, purposeful? And you know, survey your, your stakeholders. And that's the approach that we took to um, Bladder Cancer Canada. We worked with a of all things, a drunk removal company. They were B2B, and we shared a lot of content about living more green, um, decluttering, getting organized, and tips about productivity. All that type of content resonated with their audience. 
they, they, de, de, um, they removed junk from houses, but they also, when there was an office move, they would go into an office and clear out um, stuff from there. If you were taking over a commercial um, lease or something, and there was junk from the previous tenant, they would purge that kind of stuff. So anyway, it comes back to earning the right to be promotional, but not, you know, it's inverted. The majority of time should be focused on being helpful and a small portion should be promotional, but you earn the right to do so. Other questions? All right. Oh, there's the one. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me? All right. My name is Clary. I was really looking forward to your, your talk today, Andrew. I have a question about... I have a question about choosing the right platforms to begin with. So today we talked about a lot of different platforms. We talked about Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. And you also mentioned that a great strategy is to post three times a day on those platforms to really be effective. Now that's a lot of posting to do. We know that there's cross posting. We know there are tools that we can use. But if I'm just getting started, what's the best way to choose What's the best platform for me? Where do I start? Well, you know, everyone hates this answer, but it depends. So, you know, uh, LinkedIn has 800 million members globally, but only single digits in the millions in terms of people that are active. So, but if you are active on LinkedIn, that means you're more visible than most because it's such a small portion of people that are active. Facebook has the most reach of all of the social networks globally, but its organic reach is near zero. So you can't ignore it for its size and reach, but in order for me to make the most out of that platform, I'm gonna to have to do paid strategies to optimize my reach. Instagram has the highest engagement of all of them combined, but it sucks at referring traffic to my website because of that stupid extra step of link and bio. But I can't ignore it because it's the stickiest. I can't ignore it because if I'm going after millennials and Gen Z, it's their favorite with the exception or with the addition now of TikTok. So it's not about being on one. You do have to investigate which one or ones has the largest portion of the audience that you're trying to reach, be it B2B or B2C. And as much as people argue you know, the most B2B is LinkedIn, I love LinkedIn, I owe my career to it. But because of that big delta between the number of members and the number of members that are active and the, and the premium that they charge for campaigns. So a quick example. We were working with a, uh, a HR company, software as a service. They, their software helped uh, HR managers manage health and wellness programs. We were doing a campaign on Facebook, sending people to a gated piece of content, an ebook about how to run your own health and wellness program. And we were running uh, two different ads uh, with a $2,000 budget on Facebook. And I contacted a, a agency rep at LinkedIn that I got introduced to and said, here's what we're doing on Facebook. What would your advice be for LinkedIn? And he said, well, you need to have five different pieces of creative. So three more in addition to what we already had and increase the budget from 2000 to 10,000. I said, okay, well, and what can we expect in terms of projected results? He said, well, your click-through rate will go from 0 0.26, 0 0.26 to 0 0.48. So I said, a 500% increase in budget for a less than 100% increase in click-through rate? He goes, yep. I said, okay, I'll take that back to the client. Thanks, bye. Knowing full well my client's gonna go, what? And I'm not here to slag on LinkedIn, but like that, the order of magnitude of expense. Now, if you've got the money, uh, an agency friend of mine, you know, Ford was their client. So spending, you know, $150 per result on LinkedIn, if they, if it sold them a, you know, $90,000 Ford F-150, they were fine with that. But if you're giving away a piece of content for free and you just capture an email address, that's a really expensive email address. So it just, you know, I know it's a long-winded answer to your question. Take a look at each platform. It's probably going to be a collection of platforms for you to cumulatively reach the maximum number of your target audience. But also you have to recognize you're going to have to, maybe you have the same sort of content theme, 
in terms of assets. I, I want to be educational with my content. We're going to do X. But then you have to parse that. So, so what under this umbrella or theme of the content, what's the most suitable for Instagram? Okay, animated GIF, real carousel, whatever, story for LinkedIn. Um, you know, now they call them sliders, but it's you know the equivalent of a carousel on Instagram. But it's the same if you follow Gary V, he does tons of sliders on LinkedIn, which is like five pictures on a PDF. So again, it's I've got that overarching theme of my content, but I'm formatting it for the particular uh, platform. And in the case of TikTok, I've got to bring those images to life in a short, short video clip. But there's no Relying on a, on a single platform could prove you know, uh, problematic for you, but you're going to have to behave and, and create content slightly different. Um, but again, just try to work smarter. Um, can I repurpose this from this one channel to, uh, to another without being too burdensome? I hope that helps. Anyone else? All right. Thank you very much for your time.